going to look at an interesting passage this morning. And, and the reason why I say it's interesting is because it's a passage that a lot of manuscripts do not include in the Bible. In fact, um, some of the primary manuscripts from the second and third century, actually I believe it would be the third and fourth centuries, uh, do not include this part of Mark in the 16th chapter. Now what's interesting though, and we'll come, come to that in a moment, is that there are actually quotes though to these verses that date clear back into 100, 150 after Christ AD, right? That would make it about 60 to 70 years after most of the New Testament had been written, which is really pretty close to it. So, so, it's, so it's interesting. There's a, a lot of controversy. And by the way, I recommend you talk to Judy Easton. She's actually done a really good paper on this, on this very subject. And she came out on one position. I might have a different position than hers, which is probably good. Uh, but or I would not be including it this morning. I think your position, actually, Judy, was at the end, like, you know, probably kind of like, leave this section alone. My paraphrase, okay, I apologize, because yours was so scholarly written. You had words there I didn't even understand. So... <laughs> So, but she really did a really good treatise of this, and if you're interested in st looking at that, there's a very thorough research that she did, and I'd encourage you to talk to Judy, um, and I'm sure I if you twist her arm, she might let you read what she wrote. Wade, did you read it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not supposed to embarrass people on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Let me get my computer working because so I can get out of this. <laughs> How many of you have in your Bibles this little note? The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. Some of you have it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How many of you have King James? Okay, King James, you're, yeah, you've got the inspired, right? And it doesn't say anything like this, does it? So obviously that's the only translation we should be using, correct? <laughs> Good enough for Paul and who? And, and Jesus? Yeah. Okay, we're not going to go down that path either. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever doubt God? Do you ever doubt or even struggle with maybe a lack of faith? Yeah, do you ever wonder, uh, is God going to answer the prayer that you're praying? The request you might be making of him? Do you ever even doubt the resurrection? I was really tempted this morning if I had the kids. I was thinking uh, and was going to ask how many of them believed in the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and Santa Claus. Then I thought I might get in trouble with somebody, so maybe that's why the kids aren't here this morning. <laughs> but here's a danger. Sometimes we group Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and Jesus all in the same, line, same breath. And how do children know the difference when we're telling them a story that's fiction? Does anyone here believe in the Tooth Fairy? Santa Claus? Easter Bunny? Oh, I'm sorry. I knew I should have asked before, Sylvia. You're going to have to now help Harry. Okay. <laughs> I just crushed his... Well, I, I better leave. This, I'm going bad this morning. <laughs> I recall that John the Baptist, just before he's about to behead it, sends messengers, some of his disciples, to go talk to Jesus. And he says, please find out. Ask him, is he the Messiah? Why is John asking that? John had the privilege that none of us have had. John got to be there and baptize Jesus when Jesus said, Look, 
you need to be doing this because I need to uh, obey my father and I need to submit to him. And John's saying, no way, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't even be touching your sandals, let alone wa- baptizing you. This is that same John who actually saw the spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove, heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. This is John the Baptist. I mean, he had some pretty special things happen to him. God had anointed and blessed him and, he, and spoken to him. And he's the final prophet of the Old Testament. He's the, the bridge maker. He's the one who's going to come and prepare everybody for, to, for repentance, to, to call them to get ready for the Messiah. And he's call, basically sending a text message to Jesus. Jesus, are you the Messiah? I'm wondering because have I done everything for you and and lived for you and prepared the way for you and now what if you're not him? And Jesus will respond to that by saying people are being healed, lives are being changed, the word of God is being preached. Look, the evidence is right there in front of you, John. Yes, yes. I think John was at a place where he knew he's about to die and he was questioning What if Jesus of Nazareth is not the Messiah? And what if everything I've done is now going to fail because I didn't prepare the people for the right one? It's a normal thing to doubt and to question, isn't it? If you're you're a thinker, have you got universe and space and all those things all, all figured out? Do you know how God created the stars and the, and the, and the planets and, and put oxygen here? Do you know how he did all that? I'll, I'll offer you an easier way out. Just believe in all the details of evolution and it'll be a lot easier. Right? Just, we oozed. Wow, we oozed. And, and we all oozed into all these different, it's just amazing. Actually, it takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe that God is, is a creator, designer, majesty who pr- prepared and created the universe and us and put life here and sent his son into the middle of that to die for us and rise from the dead to give us life. But the fact is, is that even good, loving, God-fearing people sometimes doubt. Some of us, maybe all of us. Do you ever stubbornly refuse to believe what others have experienced? Isn't the greatest testimony, the greatest witness that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, what he did in his disciples, the lives that were changed in them? And not only in them, but as we spent our night here on Monday, Thursday, we put Jesus on trial. And what was the best testimony? The testimony of what Jesus has done in us. Evidence that Christ is alive and here with us. See, here's the problem. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then what we do here on Sundays is a big waste of time. And, well, listen to what 1 Corinthians says. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So Paul's even saying, man, this is really bad. In fact, we're liars if he didn't rise from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Mark 16, verse 8. It's a verse right before the text we're going to look at this morning. And it says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. One of the reasons why some people say that, that Mark had these other verses put on them is because, because Mark ended right there. And that's an incomplete ending. It's really abrupt. In fact, 
it's not very positive. We all in America like to have the, the hero win at the end, right? And, and this is not one of those positive endings. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. But now don't, don't miss what Mark's actually saying there. They were amazed. They were so excited that they couldn't say anything. I mean, they're still like startled about this. He's alive. Oh my. And they're like not stopping to talk to anybody, not saying anything to anybody. It's so it's overwhelming to them. But they do, see, the truth is, they do go talk about it, don't they? The women go tell the disciples, he's risen. An angel appeared to us. The tomb's empty. The stone was rolled away. Jesus is alive. So Mark's not trying to say really that they never said anything more about this. But in this moment, he wants you just to stop and kind of let you end on that discord. He wants you to, to hear the tune, and it just, it's, you're, you're supposed to play another chord. If, 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 if Paul does that sometime, you'll hear it. He's playing along, and, and you know, it's, okay, it didn't finish. Yo, Paul, finish it. We're all getting upset here. He's getting stressed out now because the chord's not following what, what, the way it should musically. And that's the way Mark, Mark wants it. The, kind of the way he did things. He wants you to have you just sit there and think, whoa, Jesus is risen from the dead. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. It makes me speechless. He said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They were overwhelmed. Well, let's get technical for a few minutes. Because it's very possible that's where Mark ended. And that that's all that he wanted to say. And he leaves it there. Although it, some say that Mark may have actually had a heart attack or something like that. And, and that's why it stops there. Uh, some say that he did write this. But, but, well, let me give you some of the technical stuff. Did you know that we have 25,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament? In fact, that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls are Old Testament manuscripts. Old Testament manuscripts. And they're hundreds of years older than the manuscripts that we had. And looking at them, they could see that the, the manuscripts are almost exactly the same. They haven't lost anything in the copying over, over centuries. Nothing. Nothing in ancient literature even comes close to the mass of manuscripts that we have on the New Testament. 25,000? Did you know that there are... 5,600 or so Greek manuscripts, and, and they go way back. We've got man Greek manuscripts from the 2nd century, from the 3rd century. That would be from 100 and 200. We, th there's a, a manuscript called P52. They're oftentimes named by where you found them or who, who, whose name was on it. Well, this one's P52. It has parts of the Gospel of John, and it dates back to 100 to 150. John wrote the Gospel of John in 90. So that's just 10 to 50 years. A manuscript, a manuscript that actually comes from right then. Somebody copied the original, most likely, and this one is almost like the original. There's another papyrus. They were writing on papyrus, so they called papyri. There's another one called the Bodmer papyri, in which we find John and Luke, and it dates from 175 to 225. And then there's a very famous papyrus called the Chester Beatty papyrus that has all four Gospels and the book of Acts, and it dates around 200. Manuscript from about 200. It's amazing the, the amount of documentation. In fact, uh, whenever you're going to do evidence ab about the resurrection and evidence about Jesus, you this is overwhelming evidence that what they taught, what they said was true. Here's the amazing part. There probably shouldn't be a lot of manuscripts from those early years. You know why? Because in the early years, there was terrible persecution. In fact, if they found things, they were documents, manuscripts were destroyed and all. And so people had to memorize everything and hold on to it and hide things and all. So there weren't a lot of manuscripts, but around 325 Constantine, remember him? He turns Christianity into the Roman religion, makes it acceptable to everybody, says we're all Christians. That has its own issues. But nevertheless, from then on, we started getting all kinds of uh, documents and copies of the word of God. 
you get into the uh, well let me take, go jump ahead there were two really important manuscripts two most important ones are called it, one is called a codex codex because it's a bound volume rather than a scroll the first one that is very important is called Sinaiticus, and it's a, written about 350. Take note of that date, around 350. It's the whole New Testament. The second important codex is the Vatican. You should say these, Judy, because I'm going to blow them. Vaticanus. The Vaticanus was written about 325, and it's the whole Bible. By the way, both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Mark at verse 8. oldest full manuscripts but they're from 325 350 and at verse 8 in the 4th century for example two of the fathers Eusebius and Jerome wrote that almost all Greek manuscripts of the New Testament end at verse 8 did they know those other endings existed yes they did they knew they existed in the 2nd century Justin Martyr and Tatian knew about other endings Irenaeus also Irenaeus in 150 200 knows about this long ending because he quotes verse 19 from it they knew the endings existed. They existed early, but even by the 4th century, Eusebius says the Greek manuscripts do not include these endings. They're not in the originals. David Guzik, by the way, most of that research um, I compiled from both notes from, from Judy and from um, John MacArthur. David Guzik says the art, he has an argument for including Mark 19, 16, 9 to 20. Many ver very early Christian writers refer to this passage in their writings, he says. It shows that the early Christians knew about this passage in the Gospel of Mark and accepted it as genuine. Papias refers to Mark 16, 18. He wrote around 100 A.D. Whoa. Ten years after John wrote John, he's writing and he say, he's actually quoting from Mark 16, verse 18. Justin Martyr's first apology quoted Mark 16, verse 20. He wrote that in 151 A.D. Irenaeus, in Against Heresies, quoted Mark 16, 13, and remarked on it in 180. By the way, this is what, 200 years before the Synodicus? Hippolytus, in Peri Chrismaton, quoted Mark 16, 18, and 19. In his homily on the heresy of Noetus, he refers to Mark 16, 19. He wrote while he was Bishop of Portus, 80, 190 to 227. The overwhelming majority of ancient manuscripts do include this passage. But here's the thing. You decide. Should it be included or not? <clears throat> Did Mark write it or not? Well, what I didn't go over is the fact is there's like 19 different words in these 100 and some words that are not in the rest of Mark. Some words are not anywhere else in the New Testament. And, and the language just appears to be different than the style of Mark. But, but you decide, does it matter? Should we look at these verses or not? Was the ending in, in verses 9 to 20 in the original manuscript? Did someone else add it later because they thought the ending was missing? Accounts and found in other Gospels, however, you need to take note. Line up with these verses. So even if this is not from Mark originally. And even if this is later edition in the body of Christ, take note. And in fact, let's walk through. Let's see the things that actually are in other places in the New Testament as well. <clears throat> Mark 16, 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Is that a true story in the New Testament somewhere else? Yes, Luke 8, 2. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. <clears throat> in fact, the story of Jesus meeting with Mary Magdalene is in John chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Now, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. 
At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and <coughs> cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So is that story in some place else in Scripture? Then that would make, make this truth, at least, right? Verse, verse 10. She went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. John 20, verse 2 says, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. By the way, if you look carefully at a timeline, it appears that Mary was there with the other ladies, started heading up to the tomb, sees that the stone is rolled back, assumes somebody has stolen the body. She runs back to get the disciples. She gets to Peter and to John and tells them, Look, somebody's taken the body. Peter and John head out for the tomb. Mary heads back to the tomb. You remember the story? They go into the tomb. The women now have already seen the angels, and the women have left, and they've probably gone back some other way because Peter and John didn't pass them by. They went a different direction. So those women are going back to the disciples. As Peter and John are going this way, Peter and John go in, find the body missing, see Jesus is not there. They start heading back. They miss Mary, who's coming back to the tomb as well. Are you following me? Mary gets to the tomb now a second time. The first time she didn't go actually in there. She sees the tomb, runs back, comes now again, and now she's in the tomb. Two angels appear to her, and the very, they start talking to her. And while they're talking to her, Jesus comes behind her, and she turns to Rabboni after, she, after when? After he uses her names. And her eyes are open now. And it's like, oh, she's heard the one who's died for her that's loved her call her by name. And now she stops crying and stops the distress and looks and sees him. In verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord, and she told them he had said these things to her. There's two different moments there, aren't there? Did that really happen? Is it, is it found in another place in Scripture? Sounds like a truism to me. Mark 16, 12 to 13. Jesus appeared to the two going to Emmaus. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. By the way, that's a common phrase. We're going to see here now three different ones of these verses. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. Luke 24. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Jumping ahead to verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. We saw him. If you look more closely at, at, at Luke there, the 24, the, the story of it is that they were walking on the road with him, and they were so distraught, and, and he's saying, what are you guys all upset about? And, and basically, say, how can anyone be around here and not know what just happened to Jesus of Nazareth? And then he starts to open up the scriptures to him, literally starts sharing with them all the things, the prophecies that relate to the Messiah and how the Messiah must die, be crucified, and will rise again. They sit down for dinner because Jesus is going to keep walking. Well, this, this man that they're with is going to keep walking. And they say, no, no, why don't you stay with us? So they go in, they sit down for dinner, and as they're breaking the bread, they ask him to pray, and he blesses the bread, and suddenly they write, blessing, bread, 
this is Jesus. And their eyes, it says, are opened, and they now realize. And now they're saying, as they're talking about that, weren't our hearts just burning inside of us as we were listening to this? We were being emotionally touched by this, spiritually moved by this, that Jesus, Jesus was supposed to die and rise from the dead, and we've heard reports of that, and it's crazy, and it's unbelievable, but, but didn't we really want to believe it when we were talking on the road? The story of the men on the road to Emmaus, is that found somewhere else other than Mark? Sounds to me like it's a truism as well, isn't it? And then this one, Mark 16, verse 14. <laughs> Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for the lack of their faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Luke 24 goes on. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? Now, by the way, if you were going to add some good things to the story, would you actually say that you didn't believe? Would you pass on that kind of information, that there was doubt in your crowd? But isn't that what was happening? So... Luke talks about Jesus visiting the 11. True? Do you believe it? Sounds to me like another truism that's found here in Mark 16 as well. But I have a question. Why didn't the disciples believe? Why didn't they believe? I mean, come on. They, they saw him walk on water. They saw him feed 5,000 and then 4,000. They saw him heal the sick. Not only that, they saw him raise people from the dead. Jairus' daughter. Hey, in fact, look at this one. It's only been a few weeks earlier. They saw him go to the tomb of Lazarus, call him out four days after he had been dead and in the tomb, and call him out of the tomb. If Jesus could do that, why wouldn't they believe Jesus has risen from the dead? I appreciate what Adam Clark says about this. He says, the unbelief of the disciples is a strong proof of the truth of the gospel of God. The fact that they didn't believe. In fact, I, I, again and again, I, I, I really appreciate Thomas. I, I, I still think we've so misnamed him. We've taken one little moment where Jesus spoke personally and straightforward to him, and we've taken that moment and we put a label on him that's going all throughout the centuries. And we call him Doubting Thomas. Yeah, Doubting Thomas. This is the one guy who said, Jesus, I'll go with you to Jerusalem, and I will die there with you any minute. And he calls the rest of the disciples to go on with him. This is not a weakling, not a wimp, not a guy who's going to back down. Thomas is kind of, must have been from Missouri, the, sh the show me state. <laughs> Thomas says, I got, I, I got to see it. In fact, thank God for the Apostle Thomas. Because wouldn't you have liked to have been there and touched? Touched the spots where the nails went in his hands? Seen the place where that spear went up in his side? Saw the nail holes in his ankles? Wouldn't you have liked to have seen Jesus risen from the dead? And Thomas does for us what none of us can do. He touches those very spots. He bows down on the ground. Oh, my God, Jesus. And then Jesus says, oh, blessed are you, Thomas. But even more blessed are those of us who will not see but will believe. Jesus rebukes their disbelief. And why don't they believe? Verse 11 says, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that he had seen him, they did not believe it. These returned and report, verse 13, these returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. In verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe. Oh, they're stubborn disciples too, those who had seen him after he had risen. One of the reasons why they didn't believe was it sounded like nonsense. If somebody told you that they had died, went to heaven, came back to life, would you believe them? 
or wouldn't you think, yeah, okay, it's, it's really cool. I've heard a lot of stories like that, but really? You know, we'd sit there and we might even smile. Out, wow, that, that's amazing. Wow. And inside, like, you know, I don't believe you really did that. I think you just died. I mean, uh, you, you were just sick. I mean, you, yeah, come on. You really died and went to heaven, saw Jesus, and came back. Luke 24 and verses 9 to 11. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. There she is again. Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words to them seemed like nonsense. And we have a world in which people hear us talking about Jesus rising from the dead, Jesus being alive, God being with us, God caring about us, loving us, and to them it sounds like nonsense. The news sounds unbelievable, and it's especially unbelievable coming from women. Which, incidentally, is probably another evidence that this is a true story. Even in the Old Testament, you did not use women for witnesses. That would mean in Jewish, in Jewish culture, women were not... I'm sorry, ladies, okay, I'm just speaking what history was, okay? I'm not saying you're not any good, but I'm just telling you that women were not acceptable witnesses. They were not reputable. You didn't use them. Only men were witnesses. But, but you did have to have at least two or more who would witness to something. So if you were going to write something that you wanted people to believe, would you tell everybody, guess who saw Jesus? Guess who announced it? Guess who told us all that Jesus Christ is risen? Women. That would not go over well unless it truly happened. Evidence of the resurrection. Well, even though it's women, Peter and John run to the tomb because they got to find out for themselves, see for themselves what has happened. And Luke 24, verse 41 says, And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? Jesus has come among the disciples. He's, he's come into the room. He didn't open the door. He just entered. And he's standing there with them. And now he's actually asking for something to eat. Risen body, resurrected from the dead, totally different, can go through walls, but also eats. Oh, it's amazing. And they're sitting there like, we can't believe this. Why can't they believe it now? Because they're amazed. They're filled with joy. They're so thrilled by this fact. This is unbelievable. Jesus is really here. He's really risen. He's alive. And it's so touching them, so moving them. They're like, I can't believe it. Have you ever had something like that happen? Watch when Reader's Die just comes to the door. I'm not sure they ever really do, but I, I think they just, you know, create commercials pretending. But watch when somebody comes to the Reader's Die just comes to the door, and they knock on the door, and they hold up this big check. You've won a million dollars for, for per, every month for the rest of your life, or whatever it's going to be. And what do the people do? I knew it was going to happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I've been waiting for you to arrive. <laughs> no, it's like, I, I can't believe it. Ah! You know, all that kind of squealing and everything like that. Like, you know, in, in fact, if they don't get excited like that, they take the money back. You know that, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> that wasn't true, so I need to take that back. <laughs> they were amazed. And First Peter 2 says, verse 7, Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In another place, it actually calls Jesus a stumbling block, a hindrance. Because when we believe that it's nonsense and the world thinks that Jesus didn't exist and he's not real, then to us, he becomes a stumbling block for us, for those who don't believe. But folks, beware. Beware a hard heart. 
and not just in the Pharisees and the Sadducees and not just in the religious leaders of Jesus' day and not just in the crowds and not just in the Romans, but, but beware of a hard heart in you. Hebrews 3.12 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Who is the writer of Hebrews writing to? Brothers and sisters in the faith. People who call themselves followers, disciples of Jesus Christ. People who say they believe in him. Brothers and sisters, let me say it, read it again. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. He goes on in verse 15, as has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And in verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about the children of Israel. The children of Israel came up to the promised land the first time. They sent out 12 spies. By the way, Joshua learned the next time he only sent two. <laughs> they sent out 12 spies. 10 of those spies, well, actually 12 of them all came back saying, wow, what a wonderful place, incredible place. But 10 of them said, but they got giants and we can't go in there. We'll get defeated. Two of them said, no. Beautiful place, giants in the land, you, you're right. But our God is bigger and let's go in. And the people voted and they supported the 10 instead of the two. And they decided not to enter the promised land. They hardened their hearts because they didn't believe in God. And the writer of the Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. How many miracles, I was thinking about this this last week, how many miracles did Jesus perform on the Sabbath in front of the Pharisees? I came up with seven. He cast out an unclean spirit out of a man, that's in Mark 1, in the city of Capernaum on the Sabbath. He healed Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever. Mark 1 also, where? Also Capernaum. He healed the man with the withered hand on, on the Sabbath in Capernaum again, Mark chapter 3. He healed the lame man by the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. He healed a crippled woman. We're not sure where, but it was somewhere around Jerusalem, maybe even was Jerusalem. He healed a man with dropsy at a Pharisee's house in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And he healed a man born blind on the Sabbath in Jerusalem. And I have to wonder, how many miracles did it take them to develop their hard heart where they wouldn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah? And they were so motivated to have him killed because they didn't believe they thought he was blaspheming. then don't we need to ask ourselves, are we vulnerable to a hard heart as well? If the children of Israel could have it, if those religious leaders who knew the law in, in detail could have it, and Hebrews is even warning us not to fall back like that, couldn't we be vulnerable to a hard heart? Do we have questions about what the Holy Spirit might be doing today? What God might be saying from his word? Do, do we have a hard heart to what God wants to teach us and what he wants to do in our lives? Because if we do, then it's time to repent and believe. Mark 1, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I so appreciate the first sermon that Peter preached. 
Again, I think another evidence that, that Peter really saw Jesus risen from the dead. How do you change from a fisherman who's failed, a fisherman who's denied Jesus, who wasn't even going to talk about it, wasn't going to admit it even to a little servant girl? How do you turn from that into announcing to all of Jerusalem this Jesus whom you crucified? God meant it for good and raised him from the dead. It's Matthew, excuse me, Acts 2, 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, hear this key word, Repent! Repent! Turn around. Let your heart truly be broken and repent. Change the way you're going and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. Folks, we need to read the word. Let the word convict us. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. And then we need to repent and believe. We also need to pray for a soft heart. And I think praying for a soft heart begins with this. You remember the man who came to Jesus? His son had, been, had demons. He said... He asked, he asked Jesus for his help. In Mark 9, 22, he says, <laughs> the man said to him, Jesus, if you can, please um, help my son. <laughs> and Jesus responds, how? If I can, <laughs> he quotes him, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. We need to ask God to help us to overcome our unbelief. That's a part of the process of praying for a soft heart. In the movie, the story really comes out, and this is a true story, by the way, okay? So, so let's forget the, moment, the movie for a minute. Lee Strobel's wife accepted Jesus Christ into her life. Lee was an alcoholic and abusive and angry that his wife was becoming a Christian, and he was going to do everything he could to try to change that. And she had a lady who was discipling her and encouraging her and trying to help her to, to stand up for God and to honor her husband and to love him to Jesus. And this lady reminded her of Ezekiel 36, 26. And she said, memorize this verse and start praying this verse for your husband. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And Lee's wife started to pray, God, remove Lee's heart of stone and give him a heart of flesh. Who did you invite to Easter services this year? We asked everyone to pray for at least three people. You know, God wants us to be world changers, and the world he wants us to change and influence are those eight to ten people right around us who don't know Christ, that are part of our family, part of our community, they're our neighbors, our co-workers, they're our friends, they're people we spend time with, and God wants us to influence them for him. <laughs> who did you invite, and did they reject you? By the way, when they reject you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. But who did you, did you get some no's? <laughs> I got some nice no's. Thank you. It was a no. <laughs> Thank you. But it, really, he was saying, I'm not coming. Because I don't agree with that stuff. Start praying for their hard hearts to become hearts of flesh. Memorize Ezekiel 36, 26, and let the word of God, which is powerful and effective, anointed and God-breathed, let the word of God start changing those people that you really care about. And by the way, if you didn't invite anybody, then start praying for your hard heart. Whoa, Bill, now that was mean. <laughs> but isn't it true? 
If I'm not praying for somebody to come to know Christ, then don't, I must have a hard heart towards the people that God loves. I must not really care about people going to hell. Or, worse yet, I don't believe that hell is real. I don't believe that God's going to let anybody go to hell. I don't believe that what he says in his word is true. So therefore, I have a problem with disbelief or unbelief, as Mark talked about. Regardless of that, I need to start praying about remove the heart of stone and give me or give that person a heart of flesh. And John 1, 12 has a wonderful promise. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you have a friend, family member, a person that you're really concerned about that maybe you invited for Easter and, and your heart is just really hurting for them? But God promises you pray for that hard heart to turn to a heart of flesh and when they turn, they will be welcomed as a child of the king. Don't you want that? Or do you want to hope that what the world says will turn out to be true rather than what Jesus says? Do you want to hope that, oh yeah, everyone gets to heaven, so whew, I don't need to worry about it and I don't need to pray for them? How hard. How hard does our heart have to be to not have a burden for people around us to know Jesus' love? So maybe the other prayer we need to be praying, I think it's even in a song, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Lord Jesus, if I have a hard heart, a heart of stone, soften it. If I don't believe that you're the, the God of heaven and earth that rose Jesus from the dead and is here with us now and wants to do incredible things for us, that he wants to forgive us our sins, turn us into brand new people, if I don't really believe that, if I don't believe that there's life after death, Jesus, then please take my heart of stone and soften it into a heart of flesh. But let's start praying that for the people that we care about as well. And let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit's work. As we wrap up our worship today, you may want to put the name of somebody. It's right there at the bottom of the tariff. A place for you to list two or three, I think it's like three names you, that, that you'd say, you know, I really want this person's heart to be softened. And, and would you commit to at least this week I know we tend to forget things, right? Some of us do. Would you for this week pray for those three people every day? Can you do that? It'll help you remember if you do it every day, by the way. Pray every day. Make a commitment right this morning that you will pray every day that those three people will have a, their heart of stone become a heart of flesh. Let's pray. God, you know if uh, our hearts are hardened already. You know if our hearts break for the things that break your heart. You know the the walls we've created, the barriers that we have to, to belief and things that you may even be telling us. You know if we need to repent and believe in you. You may have even pushed us to be here today just to, to challenge us to repent of our hard heart and turn to, turn to belief in you. Now, it may be amazement. It, it may be that we think it's nonsense. It may that be that we're just so committed to our ways that we don't want to accept the truth. But Lord Jesus, I pray that you would melt down, break down our hard hearts, that you would show us the ways and 
places in our heart where we have unbelief. And that you would soften our hearts and give us a heart of flesh. I pray that today, if there's anyone here that has been hard to you and yet realizes it's time for me to say yes to you, Jesus, that they would simply do that right now. And then tell, they would tell somebody else, I said yes to Jesus today. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a friend, a brother, a neighbor. But Lord God, may we all say yes to you today. In Jesus' name.